You are listening to the Underground Voices Network. You will be hearing unfiltered truth from voices living the news. With how the things have gotten just rapidly worse in the last few years, how has that affected your ministry, you know, your, your work there in Venezuela? The incredible thing is this, and I've seen it all throughout Scripture, some of the toughest times, I guess if you use it like your tea or coffee, you know, when the water is the hottest is when the most flavor comes out. Mm-hmm. And in all sense of what's going on, it seems that this would be a time where people maybe would complain about God. And yes, there is people that do complain. But the majority of people have turned towards God in a way that I have never seen in Venezuela. I've seen a spiritual hunger awaken. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like if you were asleep and then you drove by, I don't know, a Kentucky Fried Chicken or something like that. And he's like, oh, man, what is that? And boom, your your appetite just explodes and and your mind's flooded with thoughts. Well, that's kind of what's happened. Um, I I remember looking at people... uh, and going to their homes and, and, and bringing uh, flour with me or bringing um, uh, corn flour is what I meant, not, not wheat flour, but corn flour, which is more popular here, and, or sugar or, or beef or chicken, and walk in their homes and, and, and the sadness that was on their face. And as soon as we prayed or we'd open up scripture and eat together, you would see this like color just from black and white to color. It was a bloom. Mm-hmm. Everybody was so hungry for a God concept, if you want to put Mm -hmm. it that way, because God was approached in many different ways. You had a Catholic perspective. You had a Protestant perspective. You had maybe even a Muslim perspective. You had Jewish perspectives of God. You had uh, the Pentecostal, let's jump up and down. Uh, You had the more quieter one. You had all kinds of, but everybody in a sense was seeking God. So presenting God was I'm not going to say easier, but it became popular. Mm -hmm. We took advantage, and I don't say that in a wrong way, as if I'm over here scouting to see who's in need so I can take advantage and pry on their weaknesses. I'm I'm saying we took advantage of the need of God and and brought God with no religious perspective whatsoever. Matter of fact, our church doesn't have a denomination name, and we always declared it that Christ is the center. I've always told everybody, I said, God and his word are the two things that have transcended time. Everything else has a beginning and an end. I said God didn't, and his word didn't. And if you guys want to follow truth, come. And we've had an increase in our church, an overflow in our church. We're now doing two services, one at 8.30 in the morning, one at 10. We have a midweek service. We're starting youth uh, um, meetings now during the week, two, uh, two, uh, two actually right now. We've got trainings of all kinds of departments. We're we're feeding people during the weekends. Uh, We gather Wednesday nights Mm -hmm. and instead of people eating by themselves at home and then Mm -hmm. rush to church for a midweek uh, gathering, we just said, everybody bring what you ever got, whatever Mm -hmm. you got. Even if it's just the main uh, food, the bread here is called arepa, Mm -hmm. which is made out of corn flour. It's a little round, kind of like a cornmeal thing, but it's a little harder and whiter. And uh, I said, if that's all you got, just bring it. We'll, we've got somebody here that can fill it up for you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we'll put chicken or, or ham or tomatoes and lettuce and mayo. I mean, even that tastes good. And so we're trying to find ways. And people, what's affected the church is the amount of people leaving. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, it's, it's become an exodus. You know, people are leaving left and right. My wife's brother, just on the phone. 30, 40 minutes ago with her today, and just there, she was just bawling her eyes out. He said, sis, I've got to leave. My family is starving. And we help them every week with food, and it's still not enough. He said, I've got to take my family. We're going to leave probably to Chile or Colombia and pray for us. And I was just like, wow. So he's selling a car, the only car they've had for Eon, selling his little Fiat Uno. And he's going to sell it for $150. It's more, worth much more than that. But that's all he can sell it for because that's all people can afford to maybe buy. And with that and money that maybe we'll give him, 
he'll be able to go to Columbia with his family and find a job. And his son has already moved there. Uh, one of the most heartbreaking things about what's happening is seeing all the families break up. Right. Yeah. Church. We've got we've got ladies at our church that talk to their husbands two, three times a week because he's in Chile, he's in Guatemala, he's in and and they're working. They're working day in, day out, sending money back home. Um, some of them send it in dollars. They send it to my U.S. account. We change the money. We give it to the families. And and we've had to work so much with, with family counseling because we've yeah. actually divorces while they're separated in different countries. And mm-hmm. well, I found another woman or I found another man. And, yeah. And that's what's hurt us, it, the pain but the church itself is growing in an incredible way. And I know because it's God's in charge. It's his well, church. They, and they say, you know, that um, in the midst of persecution, that's when the church grows. That's that's historically, that's what's always been. Um, if you go back to Acts, you know, during the church of Acts, um, yeah. that's how the church grew. It was in the midst of persecution. That's why it had to go through that in order for the church to expand. Um, but you know, in in I've seen it in the Middle East. You know, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of you know religious strife, in the midst of political oppression, you name it. Um, that's where the underground churches um, yeah. really rise up. That's where they they just come together, and and you see this this overflowing of love of you know of this need of this thirst and hunger for the truth. Because, like you said earlier, people are looking for that you know, for that savior and yeah. every religion, every religion that you, you know, there's, that's out there is they have, they're looking for that one savior. Um, and even non-religious people, even people who, who might claim to not belong to a religion or claim yeah. to be agnostic or atheist, they're all looking for that one savior who will save them from their, their pains their sufferings their personal issues, uh, whatever is going on, you know, in their own countries politically. I mean, it's, and that's the, you know, that's the, that, almost the beauty of it. You know, it's that in the midst of pain in the midst of suffering, um, that's when people really come to Christ. That's when people really cling to him. And it's unfortunate that it has to be that way, you know? Um, but it's, yeah. it, it is, it's, it's beautiful when you see it. Well, I, I had to pinch my three boys once in a while to make them hear me because they weren't listening, you know, and sometimes simply calling their name out wasn't enough. And they just ignore me. So I pinch them a little bit about what I'm like, you know, I was calling you. Yeah, but I was watching TV. I know, but I called you and I need you to come. You know what? On Sunday, we had several uh, over a dozen people raise their hand and say, Pastor, can I share something? I said, yes, absolutely. I don't want anybody to hold back any emotions right now. Just Mm. drain it, let it out. And they said, Pastor, God's trying to teach us something. Uh, When the power went out for five days straight in a row, I say it right now. And as I'm saying five days, it actually sounds simpler. Yeah. Until you actually go through five full 24-hour periods and you're you're literally pulling your hair out. You're you want to bonk your head on the wall because you really are going nuts. Mm-hmm. There's bugs all over. You hear every sound in the neighborhood. People crying. People arguing. And it's desperate. The people at our church were saying, Pastor, we have never heard the pain in our community as we did those five days. And I looked at my wife and I was like, Oh, brother. Did we ever hear it as well? They said, Pastor, we had had food in our fridges, but we had never pulled all our meat from the fridge and cooked it for all our neighborhood. It says, this week we had to, or it would spoil. <clears throat> and they said, God is trying to show us, are you going to be my church or are you just going to play church? Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's the reaction. That's the reaction. What of One of our youth guys today, he, he works with our teenagers at church. He just posted about six, seven pictures on his Facebook. And he said, I thank God for not allowing me to be one of the families that 
left Venezuela to another country. I thank God for having him kept us here. He says, and these are the reasons of my joy. And he just posted pictures of him and his wife and his sons and in church and helping and working and feeding or eating. And and I'm looking at this and I'm going, wow, that's that's what makes him joyful, the church. And I've had so many during the blackout, we had multiple families all bunking together. We had people at the church, at my house, at other families' homes. It's like they decided not to sleep alone. Let's sleep together. And man, the, you kind of feel the warmth and the power of God's church when you when the when the heat's at its highest, when when the difficulty is hardest, and when the nights are darker. That's when his church you can tell it it is a light. Yeah. Or the light of the world and the salt of the earth. I love that. It was seen lately. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going into my next question as to what keeps you motivated, but that that really just kind of summed it up as to, you know, what keeps you motivated in in, you know, in the midst of all this persecution and midst of, you know, it might not be um persecution that other countries go through but it's it's still a form of persecution what you guys are going through in venezuela you know yeah. it's a it's a spiritual persecution it's you know it's oppression um but in the midst of all of this you know oppression and 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 pain and suffering um i can see that you know see being a light to those who are suffering probably the most because they don't know christ because they they don't know him personally that is what keeps you motivated. That's what keeps you going. Well, there's there's no doubt. And don't get me wrong. It's, it doesn't mean we're always motivated. There are right. so many days I have to throw the towel in and just say, you know what, babe, pack your bags. Let's go back to the States. Yeah. Uh, I, I was on staff at our church, and I loved serving the Lord there. But I knew that I, I always knew I could go back and find plenty of things to do back home in the States. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It wasn't, but a little over a week ago, it was right after the power came back. A power came back on Monday or Tuesday. And uh, that Tuesday, we found out that all diplomatic personnel were leaving the embassy. American, the next day, American Airlines announced it wasn't flying back into Venezuela until Venezuela changed. And my wife just broke. She just broke, called me into the room. She says, can we talk? I said, yeah, let's sit down and talk. And we sat down, kind of a little, uh, picked, fluffed up the pillows and leaned on each other. And she just started crying. And I was like, oh, oh, I, she was looking normal until she just started bawling her eyes out. And she cried a good few minutes there. And then after she calmed down, she said, are we staying or are we going? And, you know, I was like, wow, that's that's a... It's a legitimate question. I said, what does your heart feel? She says, my heart is screaming out on one end. Let's get the heck out of Dodge. Let's get out of here. This is way too, it's too hard. And she says, but that's about 30% of my heart. She says, the other 70%, I feel is God yelling at me and says, don't you dare. She says, because I brought you here for a time just like this. I brought you here to work with your people, and uh, and I said, babe, I'm on the same boat with you. I said, we've been encouraging so many people, and you and I need encouragement. I said, why don't we take a day off? And we did. We took a day off and just went and watched a movie, and, and actually, I downloaded a movie, and, you know, and um, we had a little bit of macaroni and cheese left, and that was from the States and hot cocoa. I don't get this stuff too often. So I pulled out all, all the, all our finest stuff, <laughs> Mac, cheese, uh, apple cider and, <laughs> and pop tarts. It was, those were my finest cuisine at the moment. The luxuries, the luxuries on the mission field and, uh, can't forget peanut butter, but we didn't have it at that moment. And I just said, Let's sit down and eat. And we ate, watched movies. We watched two romantic movies and we hugged and cuddled. And I just, we talked a lot in between the movies. And and, uh, it was like, power just came right back on. And she has been, she hosted a ladies meeting at her house, had over 50 ladies. And she prepared food and 
and just invited them and said, how about we gather every 15 days? The lady's like, yes, we need this. So she's going to host a, a ladies gathering every 15 days just to try to keep our minds busy and mm -hmm. focused. So you know what? I got to say, it's the people that God has made our hearts fall in love with mm -hmm. and the calling that God has given us that help us stay focused. And when I see my three boys constantly talk, and, and don't don't laugh at what you say, well, you can laugh, but uh, use it cautiously. My boys, my wife and I sit around the table and our form of entertainment, get this, um, back home in, in, in our hometown in Chattanooga, um, there's a restaurant called Ribbon Loin. And uh, it is it is so good. I mean, the best barbecue you'll ever eat. Hot barbecue, regular barbecue, uh, cheddar barbecue, you name it. We got it. And uh, we talk around the table since hopefully we're going to be going back to the States in August. We go, all right, what's what's the first restaurant you want to go to when you go back to the States? Hmm, I want to eat at IHOP. No, Waffle House. No, we've got to go to Cracker Barrel. So we start... And, you know, it's little moments like this around the table, just us five, that makes us laugh and have a great time. And after that, it's almost like our batteries are reloaded up again. Mm -hmm. And every morning we wake up, we sit around the couch in our family room, and we have a family devotion. And this is a good time where my family vents worries, frustrations, questions, unanswered questions, questions I can't even answer at the moment. But that's our motivational moments where we can be with each other and talk with each other. And uh, matter of fact, after I hang up with you, I'm going to finish downloading a video. Uh, we've got some popcorn being made and we're going to sit around and just watch a little movie. We're downloading off a of website and because uh, going out this late, is just very risky. There's military with guns all over. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like they're trigger happy. They just want to shoot somebody. So we're like, yeah. eh, I don't want to be the target. So, so that's, we got a lot of things that kind of help us keep motivated. Christ is our number one dependency. He's our greatest motivator, biggest fan. And, but the church, our family, the ministry, it really keeps us pumped up. Kind of circular system we encourage them and they encourage they us encourage, it's, yeah. it's it's overwhelming i've had more people from our church encourage me sometimes than even family and friends back here back in the states you know like pastor don't worry they even said hey if you feel you gotta leave we'll understand like man we won't leave you we're we're here to stick through the mud we got you so yeah, those are the encouraging factors i would say yeah i mean it's just it's i, I can I can just imagine how tough it must be to stay positive and to stay encouraged, but um, having that support system, you know, and yeah. having the family, I think it's important, but most importantly, having them, you know, support you in your yeah. mission, in your work. Um, and then of course, having the church there um, because yeah, it's, I can, I can see how difficult that might be. You know, you're, you're trying to encourage them, you know, to stay positive, the church, but they're encouraging you. And that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful relationship right there. And that's just, it just tells you about how, um, how great God is really. And, and, you know, the way he works, he just works in such mysterious ways sometimes that the people you sometimes don't expect to be the ones encouraging you are the ones who really are lifting you up. 